Hello guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Seas of Havoc by Rock Manor Games. This is a 1-5 to five player game that takes roughly about an hour, a little bit more probably to play, and is for ages 14 and up. And in the game, Seas of Havoc, you're playing as a pirate, pirating a ship, and you're playing against other pirates as well, and you're attempting to gather as much infamy as possible, and that is mainly going to be by doing damage to your opponents or damage to sea monsters. This is a deck building game in which you're going to get a deck of eight cards, a pirate, his ability and his ability cards, along with your three ships for the worker placement phase, two unique upgrades that you're going to be upgrading your ship with, your board, and of course a reference card. You're going to go throughout the first phase, which is a uh, worker placement phase and also ability to buy cards for your deck. You're going to have four cards in your hand from your deck and you'll move into the second phase where you'll be moving your ship with your maneuver cards, which can also gain benefit from flag tokens you picked up in the previous of the phases. After you go through this over and over again until your damage deck has run dry, you're going to finish the game off with that last phase, in which case you'll tally up your infamy and whoever has the most points, whether it be on the field and as well as in your deck, and of course with your upgrades, is going to be the winner. Let's talk about how to set the game up, how to play, and then of course, my review. To set up the game, Seas of Havoc, the first thing you're going to do is take the main game board and place it out in the middle of the playing area within reach of all players. Then you're going to take the flag tokens and place them down right above the flag markers on the top left and right hand side of the board. You're then going to go ahead and randomly place down the different types of whirlpools and the different types of gusts and sunken treasure. The way you place anything in this game randomly is by taking the two dice that they assign with you, a black and a white one, rolling them and checking the white die in the topmost position and the uh, black die in the rightmost position and placing them there. A three and a five, you'll go, okay, three white and five, and then that will be your place where you place that thing. You'll do that for all the gusts and and of course all the treasures and if you are playing with rocks you'll put those in if you're playing with the sea monsters you will instead place those in but only after you place your ships each player is going to get a character board a main ship and of course there are three little dirges ships the little dinghies that you'll be utilizing you'll roll your ships in then you'll roll the monsters in and then of course you will draw a card for each of the sharks if you're playing with them and place them where the shark deck says they're going to go after you've done that, you are going to then go ahead and uh, take the first player marker, place it on the right hand side of the game board, place all of the tokens, whether it be your cannonballs and or your different coins into the treasure chests if you have the deluxe version of the game. Take your market deck and shuffle it up, deal out five cards, and place all the rest of the tokens as well as decks of cards like your damage, your sharks, your sea serpents, and your krakens, and place them face down. Um, and the final thing, of course, is you're going to be taking the damage deck and making it face up. And it's going to be ten cards to start with, plus five for every player playing the game. Make sure that those are revealed because when those are emptied, that is when the last phase of the game is going to take place, in which case that's when you're going to score. Your player board, you'll choose a colored pirate, like I said before, you're going to choose a pirate and take their two pirate cards along with your starting deck. The bottom of your cards is going to note what starting deck is for, so I picked the purple pirate, thusly I'll get the purple cards. These are going to reference the boat along with, of course, the uh, main board. And then based on the pirate that you choose, you'll take the two queen uh, abilities. This is the pirate queen, so it's going to be the two queen abilities. And you'll shuffle your deck up. You're also going to take the two cards associated with your board, which are of course purple for this case, and you're going to have these little upgrades here. Each of the different boards in the game is going to come with two unique upgrade cards, as well as of course all the colored ships. You'll have three dinghies that you'll set aside, and then take a player reference. After you've done all this, you're just going to go ahead and draw four cards from your deck of maneuvers, and you'll set these aside because you won't use them just yet. Then finally, follow it all up with placing your infamy marker, the little skull token, on the zero along the game track, which is what's going to tally up points for you as the game moves on. Okay, let's talk about how to play the game now. It's a pretty simple, straightforward setup. There's just a lot of stuff. In Seas of Havoc, there are two different phases of play. It's the island phase and the sailing phase. During the island phase, the player who has the first player marker, which is the person who last visited a vote, boat, um, is going to take that marker there, and uh, they are going to take an action. Your actions are based on your dinghies. These are your workers, basically, for the worker part, placement part. And around the game board is going to be all these little circles. If the circle has a 3 or a 4 plus, you can only place there if you are playing a 3 or a 4 plus game. There also is a 5 plus as well. And if you're not, you cannot place there. So it kind of opens up more spaces when more players are playing the game. 
You can also place on cards from the market. I right? say so you have the market deck and you shuffle it and you'll deal out five cards face up. This is where you're going to be placing your guys to get new cards for your deck here. Let's talk about all the different spaces because basically how the worker placement goes is pretty simple. I place one of my ships on the circles or on a card. You place one of your ships on one of the circles or the card up until we all place all of our ships and that triggers the next phase. Okay, the top portion of the different little circles, top left, top right, are basically flags. When you place your ship on one of them, you will simply just take one of the flags and put it into your supply. This just notes that you now have the flag, but remember if anybody ever places their ship later on this space, then they can take the flag from you at a later turn. Uh, the next spaces are pretty simple. We'll talk about just all of them in general. The shipyard, sailmaker, and blacksmith are all spaces where if you go to them, put your little ship on the circle, you're gonna get the resources. The shipyard will give you two sails and a cannonball, the sailmaker will give you three sails, and the blacksmith will give you two cannonballs. When you take resources, you're going to rotate the uh, ship's wheel on your main board for sails, you'll take cannonballs from the supply and add them to your cannon here, and you'll take coins and set them off into your supply. Those are the main three resources of the game that you will be using. You also have the capital, which will give you a resource of your choice, plus the first player marker. And of course, only one player can go there every round. You have the bank, which will give you a gold and a resource of your choice, which is a good way of also making more currency. And then you have the workshop. The workshop will let you spend resources in order to pick one of your upgrade cards, pay the cost on the left hand side, and then flip the card over. It's a passive ability that you can use for the rest of the game. The trading post. The trading post lets you trade any two resources you have, whether it be your cannonballs or your sails or your coin, and turn it into something else. The deep dive, or deep cove I should say, that is going to let you remove cards from either your hand or discard pile. You can remove them from the game and they do not come back into your deck. Whenever you do remove them, which is called scrapping, you can take any resource that is in the top left hand corner of each card that you scrap. So in this case here, if I got rid of this sailing sloop of war deck starter card, I would get one sail and I would get one coin after I removed it. Then you have the market. You can place one of your boats on one of the cards. Only one boat can go to each card. When everybody places on all these spaces here, that is going to trigger the end of the um, market phase, the, the, the moving your, placing your workers around phase, in which case each player is going to then spend their currency uh, to pay for the cards from the market. And of course, just like we we're talking about how you can uh, get rid of cards by scrapping them in order to gain their benefits, so their cost at the top left, the cost at the top left of the cards in the market deck are what you have to pay in order to gain the card. You need to pay a, uh, a wheel and a, a cannonball for the card, you spend it, and then you get the card. If you place a ship on a card and you end up not being able to afford it or don't want to, you can simply get rid of the card. Doesn't count as scrapping it, but you can make sure that other players don't get it. And then after that, you'll move on to the next phase where you're going to be sailing around with your boat. The next phase of the game is, of course, the sailing phase, which is going to be basically you taking your cards in hand and everybody else as well. You'll have four of them, generally speaking. And when you start, it'll be the first player who starts and you'll be placing one of your cards from your hand into your discard pile, which is on the right hand side of your board. From there, you will activate the maneuver. The maneuver is in the square at the top right hand side of the card. It will say what your ship does. In this case, it might be move forward and then move left, or it might say move forward or move forward again, etc. The card that uh, dictates what it does is actually going to be in the middle of it. Right, on, right above the maneuver tells you what you can do with the ship, and then in the middle it tells you what is going to be performed. Some cards might say to move and then fire a cannon. And then, if you want, you can take an additional maneuver by spending a sail to move forward afterwards. Each card is unique and different in its own right, and it will do certain things, but the main things that it's going to do are rotate, move, and fire cannonballs. Additionally, now that uh, we've gotten through most of the cards in the game, there are also going to be these flags that you're going to be getting at the worker placement phase. Some of the cards that you purchase in the market deck here will have at the bottom of the card a symbol, and that symbol is going to reference a flag. And you're going to do whatever that symbol says after you complete all the actions on the card. So this one here says that you can perform a mover, maneuver going diagonal left or right. Then you may choose to spend a sail to move forward. And then if you have the green uh, sail, you're going to get a resource of your choice after playing the card. So if you have the flags and you play the cards during your turn, you're going to get the benefit. If you have a different color flag, you will not get the benefit of the card that you played. So purchasing cards of the same color that you have of flags 
probably not a bad thing, and trying to keep those flags also doesn't hurt as well. And then, of course, after you've played a card, the next player will play their card, and you'll just keep going around in a circle. If you play a card and you don't want to use it, you can simply play it and pass. And if you have no cards in hand, you can simply just pass and everybody else can finish playing their cards. If you have a damage card, when you play it, it gets instantly scrapped and removed. And if you um, want to, um, you can also choose to fire at things. So that's the main aspect of the game to score points is shooting things. You'll be shooting other players. You can hit them on the sides for two points or in the uh, bow or stern, the front or back for three points. Whenever you take damage in this game, you're going to draw a damage card and put it into your discard pile. And that card is going to be a dead draw when it gets shuffled back into your deck. When your deck runs out, you'll shuffle all the discards into your and make a new deck and you'll draw cards from there. And so that's how damage is going to kind of uh, stack up into players' decks. But remember, whenever you play those damage cards, they go away. But at the end of the game, whatever damage is left in your discard pile or in your deck is going to be extra negative points at the end. So it's important to keep track of those cards. You can also fire at sea monsters, provided you put them in the game. Um, and they are going to give you points. Each one is a little bit different. And there's a bunch of modules. It's the shark, the kraken, and the sea serpent, which we'll get into later. Uh, during my review, I'll talk about it. But basically, there's a last little thing that can happen to you, which is going to be collisions. When you bump into pretty much anything in the game, um, it's likely going to take damage. You're then going to rotate your ship if you would like, left or right, 90 degrees. And, of course, you're going to actually suffer damage. Uh, you're going to take a damage card and put it into your discard uh, pile um, for anything that isn't a ship. So if it's you hitting another ship, they'll take the damage and you'll get the point. If it's you hitting something else, they will take the, you know, like, a, like if it's like a sea monster or whatever, you'll get the victory points. But you're also going to take that damage. So anything considered a rock in the game is going to be penal penalizing you, but also giving you victory points as well. Mainly the idea is shoot everything that you possibly can. And that is it. After all of your cards are played, everybody passes. You're going to take all your ships from the worker placement area and put them back into your supply. Uh, you're going to get rid of all the cards from the market deck and place them out, uh, place out new ones, and then start again. When the damage deck runs out, uh, no matter what phase it's in, whether it be the market phase or the sailing phase, that round will be the last round in which you'll tally up your points. Your points are based on basically whatever is on the track already, plus any cards in your deck, plus any passive abilities that you have unlocked. Whoever has the most points is the winner. We'll talk about all the different unique monsters and different types of cards and whatnot in my review. Let's go. So Seas of Havoc has quite a few different uh, types of variables that you can add to the game. You have the shark, the kraken, and the sea serpent, and I like to add all of them. The kraken is going to make you remove a rock from the base game, meaning instead of having a rock down there, you'll have two kraken tentacles. And how these work is once you destroyed um, a kraken tentacle in a various number of ways, you'll be gaining victory points and possibly drawing cards from the kraken deck, which may in turn allow you to place out new tentacles. If there are no tentacles left, you'll place out the head, and the head of the kraken destroys all tentacles, and you score the most points when destroying the head. If there are no tentacles on the game board, during the next round, before the sailing phase, you'll place new tentacles out by rolling the dice. The Sea Serpent. The Sea Serpent just starts in the game board somewhere, it's got the head, and when you defeat it, it'll come back somewhere else by, of course, rolling the dice, and you're going to draw cards from the deck until it tells you not to draw any more. Every time the Sea Serpent moves, you'll add a piece of the Sea Serpent to its backside from where it left, until there are four pieces, and if you hit any part of the Sea Serpent, whatever you hit, everything else behind it gets removed, and you'll score a point for each of the pieces that you removed, including the one that you hit. And if you are never going to have a Sea Serpent, it'll just come back on the game board instantly. The Sharks. The Sharks start before the game begins, after you've placed your ships. You're simply going to go ahead and place your ships on the game board somewhere, not during the worker placement phase. You'll simply draw a card for each Shark, place it in one of the areas it tells you to place it in. Whenever you place your ships, your little dinghies, in the worker placement spaces that have a Shark, you will take a damage, but you can spend a cannonball, if you have one, to remove the shark and gain two victory points. And every end of round of phase, after the sailing phase, if you don't have sharks on the game board, you can simply draw a new card and place that shark back out onto the game board. There is an additional shark for a larger number of players, but since I have a three-player game here, I've got two sharks out. And those are all the different types of uh, unique monsters that you can add to the game board. Uh, uh, spaces uh, that I didn't talk about specifically are like, for instance, you have the whirlpool, which when you walk onto it, you're going to rotate your ship based on the way it's spinning. 
A gust space is when you walk onto it, you will move your ship in that direction, and gusts are always placed in the same direction, but are always randomly placed with dice. And then the treasure spaces. Treasure spaces will start with based on the number of players. If you land on it, you'll simply take it. You may never have more than one, and you can use it to spend for whatever resources you want or whatever cards you want during the worker placement phase. You don't get change back once you spend this guy here, and every time somebody takes one from the board, you're always going to replace it with a new one from the little stack of treasures. So you can only ever have one, there will always be two on the game board, and you can only spend them um, during this phase here, and you never get change back. So those are pretty much all the different variables for the game. I think I've covered pretty much everything. So what do I think about the game Seas of Havoc? Well, Seas of Havoc is a game that does a lot of different mechanics, like worker placement, which I love, deck management and deck building, which is great, associated those with flags that can be triggered from the market cards, which is pretty cool. Your characters have a unique passive ability and their cards are uniquely passive to them. And your ships also have a unique passive as well. So there's lots of different combinations of ships and pirates that you can utilize that can work together in the game. Then you're also going to have the different things you can do during the market phase, which are mainly going to be things like getting resources, upgrading your ship a bit, or taking cards. And then of course you have the sailing phase where you're going to be moving around the game board, attempting to shoot at monsters and shoot at your opponents, ramming into them, scoring as much infamy as you possibly can on the game board, and then rinsing and repeating. Uh, unlike a normal deck builder, a traditional deck builder, instead of drawing four, four cards or five cards or whatever, in this case it's four, uh, and playing them all and then passing, you'll play one and everybody else plays one as well. And so you're basically, I'm moving my ship and then you'll move yours and then she'll move hers and he'll move his and then back to me until we have no cards left. And the way the damage works is pretty cool. It goes into your discard pile, it gets shuffled back into your deck. When you play them, it's a dead card. And then of course, if you do not are not able to play them by the end of the game, they count as negative infamy as part of your scoring. So your objective is to just be a pirate and smash into things. So theoretically, um, I liked everything about the game, but I don't think it did anything super special in any of the different regards, whether it be worker placement or deck management slash deck building, and then of course the tactics. I think if I were to pick one of the three as the strongest, it would be the tactics aspect of the game, which is of course its highlight, so I think that's important to mention. But basically during the worker placement, there are a limited number of spaces, and you're basically either gather, gathering resources or gathering cards. There are a few other little things that you do, but they're seldom. Um, and then of course the, the, the flags, which are probably my favorite aspect of the game as far as like the worker uh, placement phase goes. Players are going to be attempting to get the resources they need for the cards that they want, trying to select which cards they need, and then maybe resources after, or resources first to get the card, but somebody might be, but be taking it. And it's not bad. There's nothing really bad about this game. It does work fairly well in everything that it tries to do, but it just never really hit the mark for me in each of the different types of things that it does. Uh, that being said, worker placement is very simple. If you've played a worker placement game before, you will understand how this game works the moment you see the game board and the spaces around the little grid here, this six by six. Then we have the deck building. So throughout the game, you're going to be spending currency to get cards from the dinghies that you placed on them. And then you'll put them into your hand, which is, I love that. I love when you buy a card, you actually get the card in deck builders. Some of them don't do that. This one does. These cards are mainly maneuvers. They'll have either A, move, or B, attack, or both. And then there's, of course, spending more resources, usually your sales, to move an additional time after you've done those things. Some cards will let you have extra cannon shots, and um, all those cards will give you a bonus, whether it be to scrap a card, draw an extra card, get a resource of your own choice, or um, play an extra card right after this one, based on the flag that you have, if it matches the card that you have which is a cool little aspect to the game. It's one of the main ways you can kind of add an engine to the, the, the game, but there's not a huge amount of engine you're gonna be doing. You most likely won't get more than eight to 10 cards. Uh, if you're going every round and you're playing four players with five cards, well, you're not gonna be able to get more than one, maybe two cards if no one goes for any of the cards, which most assuredly they will, because it's very important that they do so. Having resources without cards is pointless, except for spending sales to move your ship around the game board.
The monsters during the sailing phase. I love these guys. These guys are great. Probably one of my favorite aspects of the game in general. I love the fact that you're blowing up tentacles and the tentacles are respawning and more will spawn, cracking up the head of the Kraken and hitting that thing is gonna give you boatloads of points. The serpent, when it respawns, the first player chooses how it rotates and then it just goes around the game board until you have this long tentacled serpent. And as you bash into it or as you shoot it, you'll get extra points based on where you hit it, which is cool too. The idea of colliding and scoring points, but also potentially taking damage depending on what you're hitting is a cool aspect, a cool idea, and it works fairly well. And the tactics of this game is fine. Sometimes you might get a garbage hand, especially if you get like four damage in your hand, because maybe you just got pounded on the last round, in which case you don't do anything during this phase. Or maybe you only have a card that lets you go 90 degrees and another one that lets you go forward, and then your other cards are damage cards. So during this phase, there's like, a lot of feels good moments and definitely a lot of feels bad moments, especially if you just happen to be in the wrong space at the wrong time and there's enough players around you to make you suffer for it, in which case you'll get lots and lots and lots of damage. You can use the scrap card on the worker placement spaces, however you only have three dinghies, so if you do that you're going to limit yourself on the number of cards you can get and resources you can get as well. Plying the cards out from your hand is a good way to get rid of them, but they reduce the amount of actions you can take in the game during the sale phase. So there is a lot of like if this happens to you, you're suffering in kind of both phases and you have to kind of make the choice as to where you're suffering. And of course, if you get bullied on, you're in trouble in this game. Now, now okay, that being said, this is a pirate aggressive combat tactics deck builder game. It's got a whole lot going on with it, but the main idea is you're just shooting stuff with the cards that you get from the sailing phase. And if you can shoot the most stuff, score the most points, you're going to win the game. Now, of course, don't neglect the upgrade cards that you get, which are pretty cool. Some of them are a little less balanced than others, in my opinion, along with, of course, your starting character's special ability and the two cards in the deck. Gosh, I wish that they had another deck of market cards that you could pick from that you can buy that have unique abilities, like this one here. You can take a flag from the board and you don't have to use its flag, you don't use its flag action, but if you control more flags than any other player, you get to gain a victory point. And I loved a lot of the different actions that these characters had. Oops. I loved a lot of the different upgrades that the ships had, uh, and the quality of the game is excellent, especially the deluxe version of Seas of Havoc. It's a really beautiful game, solid artwork all around. I have no problem, no qualms with the quality. I wish every game was made like this because because it just shines and makes a good table presence. People are really interested in playing it. Now, now my review was like, my, my opinion of the game was kind of middling as to how much I liked it, because I just didn't feel like any of them really hit the spot, but none of them were bad. However, I had some players in this game that really, really loved it. They loved the aggressive combat and the scoring points and how easy each of the phases were to play. So this is gonna be kind of a light to medium type of a game. I know it doesn't look like it. Um, and it's gonna be for those players who like a little bit of like, take that, but in the form of tactic cards, worker placement, and of course, moving around the game board and shooting stuff. Overall, Seas of Havoc was a solid game. It was a solid experience. I enjoyed my time, and if asked to play, I'll play again, but it's not something that I as much so enjoyed, although I do love the theme, the quality of the game, and each of the different mechanics really, really is in my wheelhouse. So either way, it's gonna be up to you to pick it up whether you liked it or not. There'll be a link down below in the description. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Seas of Havoc by Rock Manor Games. If you're interested, like I said, there's a link down below. And if you like it, if you'd love us, if, you, if you'd love us, if you'd like to, and if you love us, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button and of course the bell notification button. We do live streams on Sundays, but not this Sunday because we're going to be busy. Uh, and of course we do uh, whatnot streams on usually on Wednesdays. Uh, pretty much that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to sailing the seas of havoc with you next time.